Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network's BRN Sunday podcast. Hope you're having a great Memorial Day weekend. I'm Jeff Snyder, your host for the next 60 minutes as we go around the globe to discuss the issues related to retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more with our experts from media, academia, and financial services. We've got another great show for this week. We're going to be really tackling all the news. There's a lot going on, so we're going to break it down for you. So stick around and enjoy this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. Well, let's kick things off with a look at the latest social media trends. Yeah. It's something we always do. And who better to do this than Devin Banerjee? He's yeah. Senior Financial Services Editor for LinkedIn. And he's also the editor of the This Week in Finance newsletter, which, of course, you can find under Devin's name on the LinkedIn platform. Devin, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for joining us again. Absolutely, Jeff. Always good to talk to you. I cannot think of any time when it has not been good to talk to you. <laughs> well, I think you're in the minority there because my wife, who has left uh, to go shop grocery shopping, might think differently. But again, you don't have to spend more than 15 or 20 minutes <laughs> with me at a time, so good for you. So, Devin, lots going on. I mean, we, we talked on the network about the recovery um, or not the recovery to be to V or not to V. We talked about tech and turmoil, <laughs> but there's so many stories that you're following on the LinkedIn platform. What's top of mind for you and the team? Absolutely, Jeff. A couple interesting data driven stories we featured this week uh, that saw some interesting conversation. The first is about trust in financial services as an industry. So Edelman. Uh, The big global consulting and advisory firm puts out its trust barometer uh, pretty continually throughout the year. And they put out a special edition this week about the state of financial services and found that trust around the world in the sector is actually at an all time high. And I I thought this was really interesting because it really drives home the stark contrast between this economic downturn and the one of 2008, 2009. If you think back to that one, of course, that was uh, ignited by bank failures and failures within the financial system. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the scenes from that time, you know, the CEOs of the big banks lined up in front of Congress, um, magazine covers, you know, vilifying Wall Street greed, uh, fiery protests that would eventually grow to become a global inferno of the Occupy Wall Street and the global Occupy movement. All of that is so much different this time around. Of course, this crisis is a, is a health crisis at its root. But if you look back to what financial services institutions did in especially March, if you remember, we talked about how quickly they moved to roll out relief measures for customers and businesses impacted by the pandemic. We talked about all of those measures around credit cards, uh, mortgages, small business loans. Um, so they move pretty quickly, and the public is uh, at least more grateful than previously uh, to them during this time. Of course, Edelman found the absolute level of trust is higher in other industries right now, um, especially food and beverage, I think, topped the list, as well as healthcare and technology. But uh, definitely some some good news, I think, for leaders in financial services. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, George Patton Jr. once said, one of the America's greatest generals said, success is is measured by how you bounce, how high you bounce if you hit rock bottom. And I I would argue that you know financial services organizations <laughs> really hit the bottom uh, in the financial crisis. Yeah. And look, there have been some bad actors, Equifax, Wells Fargo, but for the most part, I think there are a lot of really good people in the space, myself included, yourself included, ourselves <laughs> included. Um, and uh, look, I think, I think there's uh, a lot of ways to go, but yeah, I think everyone's acted really well. I think, you know, the government responded, state, local, federal responded, uh, you know, but we can always do better. Yeah, you're certainly right that trust uh, rose off of a low base in financial <laughs> services. Yeah. And I caught up I caught up with uh, Deidre Campbell, who's the global chair uh, of financial services at Edelman. And she actually said, you know, uh, she sees some, some caution and she thinks this could be a what she called a trust bubble right now. Um, a lot of people are just looking for institutions and pockets of the private sector and public sector to place their trust and their faith right now. And so she does not see this as uh, as potentially being sustainable as well. So definitely a wait and see 
approach, but uh, those were the numbers from their survey, which was conducted in April, I mm. should say. Interesting. Um, another, yeah, another interesting data-driven story we featured this week. This was a partnership between us here at LinkedIn and Zillow, uh, the home, um, the, the, the home selling and rental platform. So we looked at the best cities in which to launch a career right now, and we looked at it with at a combination of factors. Uh, median monthly rent, so so housing cost, uh, median salary for starting jobs, and a healthy amount of job opportunities. And when you put those factors together and look at major cities and metropolitan areas in the U.S., uh, you, you come up with a list. And so I'll give you a, a tease. At the top of the list, <laughs> we had St. Louis and then Milwaukee and then Cleveland and rounding out the top five were Cincinnati and Indianapolis. So wow. Midwestern cities really dominating the ranking. Um, and you can see the full list uh, under my under my profile on LinkedIn. But uh, not on the list, you know, are the cities where you and I live and our peers and some of our friends, the most expensive cities now in the U.S., you know, San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Seattle, you know, other places like that. So I think this dovetails with the conversation we've been having and many of the professional world has been having, um, which is if this remote work trend, you know, becomes permanent, might we see some of these uh, other cities uh, really pick up in terms of uh, migration and attractiveness? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that people are going to rethink, I think, uh, rethink where they live. And, and you're right. If there's flexibility from the digital uh, shift that's happening, um, why not reconsider where you're living? Are there places that are are better for you and your family? I, I, I certainly think that more migration will happen. I lo- happen. And I love the fact that these Midwest cities, uh, I think Des Moines is another one that is seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, yeah. growth. So, uh, yeah, kudos to those folks. Keep doing the right thing, and and uh, even some of them even have really good football teams. If that ever comes, if that ever comes back, <laughs> absolutely. If that, that ever helps. comes back, that, that does helps. help. And baseball teams, I should say, and hockey teams. I don't want to. <laughs> and base, basketball teams. Sorry, Devin, took you took you off message. Um, no problem. <laughs> no problem. I'm I'm going to do something uh, now that you always wanted me to do, which is I'm going to end on an optimistic Ooh, note, Jeff. So, you always, but you always uh, do. You always <laughs> end on an optimistic note. I love when you do it, though, but go ahead. So, so it is graduation season, and unfortunately, much of the graduating classes of 2020, actually, I would probably say all of them, are uh, unfortunately not having their in-person commencement. So we at LinkedIn have been gathering um, advice and essentially commencement addresses from some of the top leaders uh, on our platform. And I'm going to give you um, a couple of takeaways from each of them or from, from, a, from a selection of them. So I'll start with Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors. Mary is saying this is a, really a time to build resilience and graduates should find a silver lining in that. She says, whatever skills you can learn now, whatever accomplishments you can uh, you know, get through the door this year and next year will only build resilience for the rest of your career and the rest of your life. Because anything you can accomplish now in this difficult job market, in this difficult economy, um, means you can do that much, much better and powerfully going forward. Um, Steve Schwarzman, the chairman and CEO of Blackstone, uh, put out what <laughs> what I thought was a a, a typical investor mindset. You know, this is why he's a, he's a multi-billionaire, but he says people graduates right now, and actually everyone should internalize the complexity of this situation. He says, look for patterns. He says, look for the unique opportunity this crisis gives you to sharpen your ability to spot risk. He says, um, think about how this crisis impacts different industries in different ways. Think about it, it, how it's changing how people think and how they act, how it may be bucking decades-long trends that people have taken for granted. And he says, years from now, people will be reading about this crisis in business school case studies or textbooks, but you're living it right now. He says, don't be a passive, a passive observer. Draw your own conclusions from what you see and hear. So again, classic investor mindset where he's looking for those patterns and thinking about uh, how to apply them 
um, in the future. Uh, Reid Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn, I should say, uh, really driving home his point that relationships matter. He says behind every breakthrough, every industry trend, there are people. He says you can read in the news, you know, what's going on in the world, and that gives you knowledge and awareness, but only your relationships will create true opportunity for you in your career and in your life going forward. I'm inspired. You did a great job with that, Devin. I think maybe next time you should give. Have you ever given a commencement speech? Maybe I should give the speech. I think you should. Have you ever done that? I've spoken spoken to smaller groups of young people. They come by LinkedIn all the time, and I get to speak with them. But, uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, put some of all this together into my own speech. Yeah, well, it looks like the way things are going. You'll be, you can do it by Zoom or Microsoft or Skype or Microsoft Teams, one of those applications. Right. looks like the way things are going. Well, Devin, always great talking with you. Great information, great insight, and we did end on a very high note. What a great way to start the show. Take care, enjoy your weekend, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Welcome back. Now we're going to talk retirement. And on the line is Dow Jones Market Watch's retirement reporter, Alessandra Melito. Hey, Ali, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. It's a, as I've been saying all throughout the show, it's been a beautiful day. I'm very difficult. Sorry. I'm going to ask you to repeat. I have my um, okay. my headset, and for whatever reason, it keeps trying to um the connect even though i'm trying to make it not do that okay no worries sorry okay where did it go i'm losing my mind i don't know if you could tell no okay. you're fine I found it. here we go i'm just connecting it all right ready yeah here we go <laughs> three two one welcome back we're now time to talk retirement on the line dow jones market watches retirement reporter alessandra Molito. hi ali how are you i'm good how are you Doing well. Doing well. It's a beautiful day out. It lifts the spirits. Hopefully, it's a sign of a lot more positivity to come. Let's jump right in, though, because a lot going on in uh, in retirement and specifically nursing homes. I know that's been a focus of yours over the last several weeks. Yeah. So I have been focusing on nursing homes a lot more than I used to, even though I, I always did look at them a little bit. Um, but with uh, the coronavirus and just like the financial, mental, and physical impact on older people, you know, they've been top of mind. Um, this week, the uh, Federal Trade Commission came out with a report that said that some nursing homes and long-term care facilities are actually trying to take the stimulus money from their residents if those residents are on Medicaid. Um, and just to look out for that, because that's actually not something that is allowed or, you know, even you know, it's definitely not encouraged, but it's not something that they can even do, really. Mm-hmm. So um, the FTC was just basically warning residents and, and family members that if you do have someone or you are someone who's living in a facility and they try to say that, like, because of income levels or because of, you know, just the fact that you are on Medicaid, if, you know, that they could take your, your stimulus check, the answer is no. They cannot do that. Fight it file a complaint and just uh, be done with it. Um, the reason why, I know that there are, you know, various rules and restrictions when it comes to income if you're on Medicaid and you live in one of these centers, mm-hmm. but the stimulus checks are considered tax credits. And tax credits for legal purposes is not considered income in the eyes of the federal government. So, you know, and so far as like, um, you know, income threshold, mm-hmm. like how much you have to have in savings in order to qualify um, to live in a nursing home and so on. So they're saying this money is really for the residents to use as they wish. You know, if they want to give to charity, if they want to put it away for a loved one, that's up to them. And it has nothing to do with the nursing homes and they can't, you know, they can't say otherwise. Wow. So what, So people, you know, if people are just hearing this for the first time, they can certainly read your article on the marketwatch.com website. You can look up Alessandra Melito. But is there information that they can glean from the FTC website for more details? I mean, it's a point, you know, maybe the nursing homes aren't aware or the, and they're just trying yeah. to, you know, I kind of, this to me almost sounds like garnishing wages in a way, you know, like when you, yeah. you try to take people's money away, um, especially when they're on Medicare. So it just seems like people just need to be pointed in the right direction now. Yeah, so the FTC has um, 
like a consumer warning on its website, and it also says that you should file a complaint with them as well as um, reach out to your state attorney general. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's that's important to know. And, yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be malicious. You know, there are facilities that maybe they don't really know the rules. They know that they have to have certain income levels, but they haven't looked too closely into the stimulus checks. I mean, if you think about it, so much has happened in the last couple of months. I know we're all stuck at home, but, you know, the world is still turning and, and things are happening fast, especially yeah. with the number of cases and deaths and, and rules in order to try to help people. Like, there's a lot going on, and these facilities are also overwhelmed. I've written about a lot of different places and, you know, heads of uh, nursing home associations that are saying that they're just running very thin and yeah. they don't have the resources available, you know, not even just financially, but also medically to protect themselves and their staff members and their residents. So it could be be that these facilities truly don't know. But either way, um, it was an eye-opener for people with loved ones in nursing homes and long-term care facilities to just be on the lookout. Like, that stimulus money is not meant for anybody else but the individual, and nobody could take it from them. Yeah, and this is the most vulnerable part of our population. Obviously very vulnerable when it comes to the coronavirus, but also vulnerable when it comes to scams and you know just uh when it comes to money yeah. issues right and i'm glad i'm so glad that you're focusing on this uh in terms of your writing i mean i know you cover a lot of things and you want to h- cover one other story but i mean this to me uh, you got we have to protect uh the people that came before us the generation before us so i'm so glad that you're doing that yeah they are vulnerable uh, medically speaking you know um they're really vulnerable there, um, but also uh, financially. You know, not everybody who um, lives in nursing homes are, you know, were well off before that they got there. Um, and this coronavirus, you know, it just makes it worse for that demographic in general. So um, I was uh, really interested when I saw the FTC had issued a report, you know, just telling people to look out for that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, well. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm so glad you're covering that. I know you also wanted to cover another retirement issue. I think there were some numbers that came out, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So the New School Short Center for Economic Policy Analysis, they <laughs> did a report recently about um, just how this crisis can uh, potentially affect Americans' retirement plans. Um, it was not good news exactly. Basically, they were saying everybody and anybody, no matter how much you earn, prior to this crisis is at uh, risk of, you know, some sort of detriment because of the coronavirus crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, It was saying that people who retire at 62, usually they have a replacement ratio of about um, 55%, which is, you know, how much you're supposed to make up of your pre-retirement income. Um, But because of this current crisis, they can expect that figure to drop to 48%. And just to give you context, usually advisors will say that you should um, have about 70% of your pre-retirement income replaced for retirement. So, you know, already people were hitting that number and the crisis is only making worse. And that's for people who retire at 62. If you retire at 65, you could expect your replacement ratio to drop from 69% to 60%. Um, And it uh, basically the report just goes on to say that Everybody will be hit, you know, low earn, in, uh, sorry, low income earners mm-hmm. will be, uh, they'll suffer from the crisis because of, you know, jobs and unemployment. Unfortunately, that group typically doesn't have too much saved for retirement. They live paycheck to paycheck, you know, they don't have enough to put aside or they might not have access to a 401k depending on the, where they work. Um, so they won't feel it so much as market losses. They'll feel it more in the just like trying to get by safe you know, yeah. retire one day. Um, yeah. High income earners will definitely see it in market losses um, just because they typically do have the ability to put away money in a 401k or other type of plan. And then middle income earners will suffer on both ends. So, you know, some of them may suffer because of unemployment and others who do have money saved away will, you know, see some sort of impact in their uh, portfolio. Um, And if they're not saving as much as like a high income earner, then, you know, every dollar accounts always. Um, So it's just, it was 
you know, it was a sobering report, but it just goes to show why it's so important to think about this stuff. You know, advisors I spoke with said that replacement uh, replacement ratios are more important when you're younger and not thinking about retiring anytime soon because, you know, it's a goal to, you know, aspire to. Um, as you get closer, you switch gears and you move away from the replacement ratio more to like um, withdrawal rate, like how much you expect to take out every year from your portfolio or whatever savings you have. Um, so that, you know, that was nice to know, like you shouldn't, don't freak out if you don't have 70% of your pre-retirement income saved. But it was just, um, it was, it, you know, it, it's still stressful to hear those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. We weren't saving well before. Now this is going to really put a dent. And I think this kind of get plays into that income disparity and retirement savings disparity and, and gap that we're seeing um, really widen just because of all these uh, financial issues. Um, well, Allie, always a pleasure talking with you. Um, thank you so much for all the great work you're doing and for sharing a little bit of time with us and the audience. And have a great weekend. Enjoy the long weekend, and we'll talk to you again next week. Joining me on the line, he's the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network, Mr. Oliver Rennick. Oliver, how are you? Hey, Jeff. Hey. Good. Thanks, man. Hey, good to talk to you. How are things going in Chicago? Uh, waiting for it to get warm and waiting for it to open up. We got one more week, and uh, governor's going to start to have a gradual reopening. Good for you. Good for you. Hopefully the the numbers continue to head in the right direction. And speaking of numbers, let's talk about markets. Um, I want to get, you know, you have two very influential shows, one in the morning and one in the late afternoon, uh, markets hey, on the close. You. Very influential. And, and you have a lot of notab- notable people <laughs> on, and, and you've had me on, so less notable people. But let's talk about what were some of the themes, really less notable people. What are some of the themes um, for the week? Yeah, this week is another kind of just sideways move for the S&P 500 as a whole. Um, What we've been discussing has been really since mid-April, just this kind of gravitation uh, where the market is not really broken out in either direction. Um, It seems like the longer we go in this way with so much at stake Mm -hmm. that the move out of this kind of – consolidation period is probably going to be a really important one, maybe a big one. And just kind of going from the analysis of things right now, it does look like bulls kind of still have a little bit of an edge markets near the high end of that range. Uh, Probably the most eventful day we've had over the past two weeks was actually last Thursday when equity markets started to dip and then turned around and had the very interesting rally that was, led by stocks and sectors that had not been the best performers in this recovery. So what we've actually seen is some follow through to that this week where the Russell 2000 uh, has had a little bit of outperformance. Small caps are outperforming. Banks are doing all right. Hmm. Some of the consumer focused travel in brick and mortar companies did pretty well this week. Not like amazing, but hanging on there. Uh, It's not, just a tech and stay-at-home trade over the last seven trading sessions or so. And and that's kind of the the only thing that's really happening here. It's happening within the market, um, and it's not happening at the price of the big tech leaders yet, but the market is kind of staying in check as some of this churn happens on a kind of uh, intersector basis. Oliver, uh, earlier in the week, we had some really good news sounded like good news with, with respect to vaccines and that seemed to set the market. You yeah. know, we, we always try to pull, put one, I mean, you know how we humans are. We like to push to put to point to one thing and say that was the result of a pop in the market, but that was some good news. And then we just had the federal reserve chairman and the treasury secretary kind of give, I don't know, conflicting, but like, and the CBO, the congressional budget office giving some conflicting recovery information. How does that all kind of play in, to your narrative, not your narrative, but the narrative that you follow Um, all week long? Well, I think that's a good question because it's hard (laughs) when, you know, nobody has any particular insight into how likely there is to be 
a vaccine or a timing of it or what the response would be. There's still even a lot of variables if you accept that there will be a vaccine or a powerful treatment. But looking at the market, it helps the to define some of the, the clear responses. And that's really where we saw the follow through this week from last week on that type of reopening trade that I was describing. And since then, it just kind of stopped. So we had a big move on Monday and we're basically still there. Uh, the Russell 2000 hasn't really moved much from then. It's inched up a little bit. Um, but that really started on Thursday last week, kind of carried through on Friday, really extended Monday on the Moderna news. And we've kind of chomped since then. U.S. China is kind of getting a little rocky again, but that still is probably a secondary or tertiary concern for the markets. It does seem that there is this creeping trade and trend connected to economic reopening that is trying to push the market higher. Uh, but it, one, is probably not convincing enough yet, mm -hmm. the speed of the reopening, the success of the reopening. We probably need to have a few more weeks to see those curves in open states continue to go lower. Any surprise there or an upturn would probably not be well received by markets. And then the second thing is that even if all of that goes well, which we hope from a kind of just a, a human in standpoint, there's this question of, okay, well, you know, can banks and small caps be as powerful a force for the market as techs, big tech companies gobbling up all of our online spending and, and whatnot? So I don't think that's really that big of an issue. I think that um, the same tech companies that did well in quarantine are obviously going to do well outside of quarantine. They were doing well before this, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, all these companies, Alphabet. So, um, But there could be some kind of churn within the market. Yeah. So uh, still the priority is watching how the economy moves along because if it doesn't move along, then markets are probably getting close to – a risk point related to fiscal policy and whether or not we have enough. So um, we, we probably would like uh, to see some compelling evidence that our existing government support will be enough for this crisis. And if not, then we're going to have to get information. There's more coming. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what we'll be looking for towards next week. Oliver, we've got the exactly. Memorial Day weekend, but following Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend, you and the network and the team at the network, you guys are doing another town hall these are great educational sessions last time you did yep. it it was about three or four hours long you were in a set uh do you want to talk a little bit about in the next couple of minutes about what you're planning to do anything you can share and how people could tune in yeah sure i appreciate it um it's going to be live on the network uh, tdmiratorynetwork.com um it's going to be focused on some of the things we're discussing right now and kind of a follow-up to what we talked about last time which was uh, just the nature of trying to navigate these really different type of um, markets that are uh, where the cause and effect has totally changed. So trying to figure that out is really important. Uh, what's moving markets and and why? Uh, that's kind of the discussion we're having here. We're going to have that on a broad scale. People can submit questions. There's a hashtag TDA in town hall. Uh, we're going to be responding to our viewers and their questions about the market right now is uh, reopening starts to take headlines as opposed to quarantine and, and virus chaos. So uh, we will try and figure out what all that means for kind of next phase of market. Yeah. And, and just as in terms of numbers, pure numbers, I think you had over 2 million people that tuned in either live or I guess watched it on the re-record, right? I mean, the, yeah, we, yeah, it'll be going all weekend. So um, we, we get a, we get a lot of good feedback and it was really exciting. So I'm looking forward to seeing what is on people's minds and um, always fun trying to, uh, you know, answer questions as they're, as they're coming in. So um, we're excited about it. Absolutely. Well, people should certainly check that out. You can go to TD Ameritrade network.com. I think it's H E T P S colon forward slash forward it. slash. There you go. Oliver, always a pleasure chatting with you. Enjoy the weekend. I hope the weather warms up and I hope you get out and uh, enjoy the long weekend. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye. One, one, two, two, three, Doggy, Morgan, Welcome back. We're going to talk a little personal finance. Joining me online is Ms. Mari Backman. She is personal finance reporter for The Motley Fool. Hi, Mari. How are you? 
Doing okay, Jeff. How's it going? We're doing okay. It's a sunny day here. We're recording on a Friday afternoon. Beautiful and sunny. Hope it's nice in your neck of the woods in New Jersey. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm only about 45 minutes south of you, so should we, we shouldn't have too much variance in weather. And you know, looks like we'll enjoy some sunshine today. Absolutely. And the and the kids and husband, everyone's okay. Yeah, we're all we're all hanging in there. Thanks for asking. Uh, but but I'll tell you who's not hanging in there. Yeah, please. <laughs> I'm gonna just, you know, take tell that, me. Take that sly pivot there. Yeah, um, that was very you know, sly. Uh, Thank a, you. <laughs> a, a lot of Americans have already spent their twelve hundred dollar stimulus payments that they may have gotten, you know, at some point, um, you know, over the past month. So you know, some people right now are a little bit desperate for money. Maybe they're income has been cut, their hours have been cut, they're incurring new expenses because of the crisis, and so mm. they need money. And uh, I actually, I was reading just the other day that for people who have filed a tax return, so far the average refund this year has been close to $2,800, which is actually twice the amount of wow. you know the per-person stimulus payment that went out. So the thing is, Jeff, a lot of people haven't filed their taxes yet because the IRS pushed the filing deadline back all the way back to July 15th, um, you know, just because of everything that's going on. I mean, and especially when we think back to where we were, you know, just over a month ago, I don't think anyone really had the mind frame to, to say, okay, let me, let me stop what I'm doing and get a tax return done. Mm -hmm. But – uh, but when I read that, I, I said, you know, gee, there's there's a lot of people out there who are probably just waiting to the last minute to file their taxes because they can. And, you know, we all still have a lot going on right now. But, you know, my advice would be if, if you're kind of having a hard time covering bills right now, you've spent your stimulus check or maybe you haven't gotten it yet and you're, you know, expecting it in the mail and, and that could actually take a few more months too. Um, if you think you'll be due a refund, if you usually get a refund, Go ahead and file your taxes yeah. um, sooner rather than later to you know get get that money going sooner. I you know I, I agree with you and I, I my personal rule of thumb and not that I like to get refunds because I like to hit right at that number where I'm not lending the government money for a year, um, and so I like to hit hit zero but and not owe anything either. Uh, but the, right. the first inkling that I have for my accountant or my software that I'm I'm to get a refund, I'm like we're filing. And that's what we did, even though you're right, federal taxes and I think state taxes here in New Jersey are not due until mm -hmm. till, um, July 15th. Uh, but that was the first thing that came to my mind, and I think Americans will be well advised to do that, get it done now, get it in there. Do you have any sense, Maury, about what the turnaround time would be now with the IRS in terms of processing those refunds and getting that done expeditiously? So it's interesting that you say that because under normal circumstances, the standard turnaround time for a refund for electronically filed returns is about three weeks. And okay. you can even expedite that a little bit more by um, signing up for direct deposit. For paper returns, it's usually about a six-week turnaround because that has to be physically processed. So right now, um, I'm actually hearing that there are some delays on mm -hmm. electronically filed returns. Interesting. But, what, but what's more problematic is that basically paper return processing is effectively on hold because the IRS is understaffed right now and field offices are closed down and whatnot. Uh, so, I mean, basically, you know, it, it's a little unclear as to exactly what's going to happen with paper returns, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, I don't recommend filing on paper in general, and I certainly don't recommend doing that this year. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right about that, Mari. Let me ask you a lot. We talked about the CARES Act. I think we talked. You just mentioned the stimulus payments. Any sense? I know there's a new bill that's out um, from the uh, from the Congress. It has to go to the Senate. There's a lot of back and forth that has to happen. But any sense of whether or not they could be enhancing the stimulus packages and stimulus that were that were pr provided? Because so many people around this country may not be in uh, areas or cities or locations where they're reopening, right? I mean, it's going to, it's this phase reopening. And so there might be not, they may be in this situation for a prolonged period of time. Right. I mean, I think probably no one knows that better than us, Jeff, because I think New Jersey is going to be yeah. one of the last states to, to fully open just because of our heavy concentration of cases. I yep. mean, uh, you know, we, we basically had, other than New York, we had the second largest number of cases in the nation. And 
our, I think our rate was more comparable to New York City just because, you know, of that whole dense population situation. Um, and, yeah, and also, you know, the fact that people, you know, states are reopening, I mean, that's, that's great, but we don't know if a second wave is going to come and if things will just shut back down. So there's definitely, there's definitely talk of um, additional stimulus cash. There's a few, you know, proposals that have, that have been floating around. There's the HEROES Act, which calls for – it's actually – it's still a $1,200 – stimulus payment per person, um, but where it differs from the initial stimulus package was that the initial one gave you 1200 per qualifying adult and then 500 per qualifying child. And the HEROES Act is asking for 1200 per qualifying person, whether it's an adult or a child, wow. up to three kids per household. So that effectively, if you're a if your income falls within the thresholds to get a full stimulus and you're two adults and three kids, you could get a $6,000 check. Um, you know, that said, let's not get too excited because Republicans have been uh, really pushing back on that proposal. And, uh, you know, it's it's just a little – I think it's a little speculative right now to, to yeah. talk about, you know, to talk about what's going to happen. Do I think that there will be – some sort of follow-up relief package. Yeah, I, I do think that there will be some degree of follow-up relief, but I don't know that it's going to be, you know, an ongoing stimulus payment, which, you know, a different, a different bill proposes, a, you know, a recurring stimulus every month. I don't know that families are actually going to get a $6,000 check. I think it's just a little too soon to know what that's going to look like. Yeah, I think you're right. And while you're waiting for this, which could take weeks a month, months, get your taxes in, do it now, but do it electronically, as Mari suggested. Mari, always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for uh, dropping by the program. Well, not literally, but figuratively, of course. We always enjoy having your insight. Take care of yourself, and we will talk to you again very soon. Sounds good, Jeff. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome back. We're talking healthcare now. And joining me on the line, she is the senior correspondent for healthcare for Business Insider, Miss Lydia Ramsey. Hi, Lydia. How are you? I'm good. How about you? Uh, it's sun is shining. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And look, hopefully we'll get through this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Things like seem at some point seem to be cooling down. Uh, but I'm so glad you could join us, and I know you're incredibly busy authoring Dispense, and people should certainly check out that newsletter on the Business Insider website. That is all the nitty-gritty that you need to know each and every week for healthcare. But, Lydia, what's top of mind for you and the uh, Business Insider team this week? Yeah, I think some of the biggest things we're thinking about are um, a lot around, you know, we saw this week a lot of development around vaccines. So we mm -hmm. saw the first human data results coming out, which is pretty crazy to think about, right? We, we first heard about this virus at the start of January, and here we are in May talking about a potential vaccine. Yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things where I think a lot about how usual drug development works. I think probably in the past, you might not have seen results for a couple of years. You know, it usually takes about 10 years to get a drug across the line. So it's pretty crazy to think that we might even have the chance to have a vaccine in the fall. Um, so, so yeah, so on Monday, Moderna came out with some data. They just kind of released a press release talking about it, and, and it kind of suggested from their really early data that the vaccine was doing what it was supposed to at a really base level. We still don't know if it's protective against the virus. Um, mm -hmm. We'll learn that as more trials come out, but in a small, pretty small data set, so we're looking at like 45 people, it seems to be producing the immune response, at least in the body, that we're looking for, and it's safe, so that's good. And then <laughs> um, today, there was some new data, too. So another vaccine developer out of China came out with its own data set um, for its vaccine, and it, it seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. So early days still, but it's pretty crazy to think about that. What? I, it, was, it was good news to wake up to and, and hear about that yeah, we it, might actually have something that works. Yeah, and I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And it kind of drove the market. I know we'll get into some market discussions later with some of our colleagues, but um, that that's good news for, I guess, for the market. And it's good news for people wanting to get out, knowing that eventually a vaccine will come. And I, I guess it's just amazing that they were able to do that. I mean, the, the effort, as you were describing, it really is Herculean, for lack of a better term, to be able to create something in such a short period of time. To your point, 10 years it usually takes sometimes to generate a virus uh, or a vaccine. Um, and it's not always – the results are not guaranteed. So I think people have their fingers crossed. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Liddy, what about testing? Uh, that has been a uh, common theme uh, conversation of, you know, in press conferences. How How is testing looking? I know some of the insurance companies were – uh, going to be picking up testing and the cost of testing, but how, how in general has testing been going from your perspective as a covering the space? Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's definitely a lot more widely accessible than it was, of course. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people, you know, kind of press pe- press companies to be really more specific. So, like last week, there was a study coming out of NYU researchers, kind of poking holes and and asking questions about the accuracy of Abbott's rapid test, the one that the White House is using, uh, hospitals are using it, too, to get really fast results. Um, And and so, you know, it's one of those moments where, again, like, things are moving so fast that there are things that are probably going to be not that accurate and things that are going to be really accurate, and that's going to be great. Um, And and we won't know. We just have to do what we have while we have it. Um, On the testing front, you know, I think we've seen a lot of folks really think critically about what how much that plays into their real um, mm-hmm. not just states but we're talking about you know offices too i can't imagine a world in which i get to go back to an office without having first had a live virus test or an antibody test something that shows okay did you have this or did you not um and, and maybe that dictates whether or not i get to return sooner whether or not it means you know i have to take additional precautions do some temperature checks things like that um, so, yeah, it, it seems like it's getting much more widespreadly available. You know, you see people like I've got a lot of primary care practices in my inbox that I've been to in the past advertising that they have the test on hand. Um, so that's great to hear. And it seems like it, it obviously it's going to be so important to know who has it and who doesn't going forward. But I really hope that we are able to do really useful things with that data, too. Right. Like if I just take this test and it's like, cool, I have an antibody. What does that mean? You know? Hopefully we can learn a lot more about what it means to, you know, have some kind of immune response to this virus, um, and, and we can make a lot more use of the data. And I was going to ask you, um, and it, maybe it's too early to tell, or to talk about this, but when do you start thinking about lessons learned so we can prepare? Because I guess all experts are pretty much saying that this isn't just like a one time and we're done. This is probably going to come back in the fall. This is going to come back next year. I could come back in the future. When do we start doing like the lessons learned um, and and to improve our responses, both at the state, local, federal level, right? I mean, that there's some, yeah. definitely some lessons here <laughs> for all of us. Yeah, I think I think they they've been going on since the very early days. You know, I think I think a lot of people are learning and adapting as we go in this response and also thinking ahead. So, you know, you talk to a lot of hospitals, they're bracing for that fall wave, you know, they're stocking up on protective gear, um, things that they didn't do before <laughs> this first one. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where I think a lot about, you know, a couple of years ago, we were talking about pandemic, it's kind of this abstract concept, but now everyone in our generation has lived through it, you know, so it'll hopefully lead to better responses in the future. Um, I'm not holding my breath for that, but yeah, it's, it's going to be really – hopefully people have already started to learn from it, and uh, we're going to hopefully see some different responses when we look at kind of the next wave. Yeah, and it certainly makes those movies like Contagion, Outbreak uh, – I forget all the others, but you know those are the ones that I remember. Uh, it makes them more – truer than what they were because we hadn't hadn't gone through this so i think a lot of obviously some really great moments uh this week with some vaccines and i think over time there'll be some lessons learned about how to do this better and that's what you know there's clearly going to be some things that we can do better lydia always a pleasure chatting with you and people should certainly check out dispense you can find that on the business insider website Have a great weekend, Lydia. Enjoy the weather. I think it's supposed to rain a little bit tomorrow, but enjoy today's weather, and we'll talk to you again very soon. My friend, JP, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Fine. You've been outside at all today? It's beautiful. Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Been been working away, so uh, hopefully we'll get out later. Okay. Well, you do so because I think the weekend is supposed to rain at least tomorrow. Um, yeah. Do you have time for 10 minutes? I do. Okay. What would you like to talk about? Do you want to talk travel? Do you want to talk personal finance? Do you want to talk real estate? Do you want to talk all three? Uh, let's 
talk. Uh, let's do. Why don't we do real estate and then travel? Okay. Here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome back. Now we're going to talk real estate and travel. And joining me on the line, he's a uh, well, he's like a double. I don't know, like a Hydra almost, Mr. Jacob Passy, real estate and travel reporter for Dow Jones Market Watch. Uh, Jacob, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. I hope you weren't insulted that, that I called you a, a Hydra. I don't like, you know, that's no, my, my, no, dungeon, like my dungeon. My Dungeon and Dragon days are showing themselves. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you are multifaceted. How about that? That's better. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's jump right in. Lots going on, you, you know, in the in the travel and the real estate industry. What what do you want to talk about first? What's top of mind for you? Yeah. So this week on the real estate front, lots of data came out um, looking at you know what went on back in April in the real estate market, and it was pretty pretty rough. Um, you know the the numbers for existing home sales dropped the lowest levels since 2010. Um, housing starts fell quite considerably as well. So, you know, it was a really rough month for the real estate industry, and, and you and I have definitely been talking a lot about that, you know, as this progressed. Um, but seeing it kind of in those numbers was, was quite shocking. Um, interestingly, uh, one weird ripple that happened with uh, existing home sales figures, um, the, which come out from the National Association of Realtors, mm -hmm. um, they also track uh, prices. And the median home price uh, reached an all-time high in April, um, which, is, which is interesting because, you know, there's been this ongoing discussion of, you know, whether or not, the situation in the real estate market will cause home prices to fall or to increase. And I'm sure lots of folks looking to buy a home are hoping that prices will fall. And I'm sure lots of folks <laughs> uh, hoping true. to sell are, are hoping the exact opposite. So, yeah. um, and, and it's been kind of an open-ended question because, you know, obviously demand fell, fell off quite a bit there um, in, in April. Um, but at the same time, you actually saw, sellers refraining from listing their homes. So there were far fewer homes on the market, and that's still the case now. Um, and so what that means is, you know, uh, demand has actually picked back up. I think you and I talked about this a little bit last week or the mm -hmm. week before. You know, the applications for mortgages used to purchase homes have increased in number um, in recent weeks, um, which is kind of the first step in the process. So uh, you'd expect to see lots of people you know, coming into the market looking to buy uh, with their financing lined up. Um, so given that, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of folks shopping around for homes in, you know, the later spring and certainly this summer um, as social distancing rules loosen and people get used to shopping for homes online. But sellers haven't come back to the market uh, quite as quickly. Um, lots of folks still holding off on putting their homes up for sale um, because sellers were worried about a downturn and were worried and you know didn't want to put their home on the market only to see it linger there for weeks and weeks on end, causing them to need to drop the price. Um, so what that means is if you're in the market to buy a home right now, um, you're probably going to face a fair amount of competition. I mean, obviously it depends on where you live. Um, and some markets like the Bay Area are still pretty soft right now, so you might actually find a deal there. Um, but by and large, it's going to be more expensive, um, quite likely for you to purchase a home right now. Yeah. And I, I was going to, you made the point for me, but I think it's going to, uh, vary depending on the region of the, of the country because people are opening up and there's more opportunity and there's, you know, here in the New York area, the tri-state area, we're still experiencing the impact of the coronavirus. Other parts of the country may Experience complete are experiencing a completely different phenomena, and therefore that will have an impact on their real estate. Jacob, I want you to flip your head because I, I want to be think, thinking about vaca vacation. Memorial Day weekend is this weekend, and we have Memorial Day tomorrow. That usually kicks off the summer. I, I know many Americans are thinking about getting back on the road, doing some kind of vacation, whether they will or not. You oftentimes have a lot of answers. Do you have any answers there? Yeah, so if you're looking for a theme park vacation, got some good news there. Okay. Um, Legoland in Florida, in the Orlando area, they announced that they will be reopening on June 1st. So that's, you know, just a few days away, really. Um, and uh, Universal Orlando, so Universal Theme Parks in Orlando, they made a big presentation to the Corona Task Force, Coronavirus Task Force, 
in Orange County, Florida, mm-hmm. um, which is where you know all the major theme parks are located. Um, so they made a, a presentation yesterday in which they told the lawmakers that they are aiming for uh, June 5th open, reopening date wow. for their theme parks and gave some more details on, you know, kind of the plan for how they'll be keeping people safe, which is certainly interesting. So not technically guaranteed yet, although uh, all signs are looking like it will likely reopen on June 5th like they want it to. Um, technically speaking, the, the task force, has signed off on the plan, but then it goes to the county governor or county um, mayor, uh, who then has to sign off, and then after that, it goes to the state government, uh, and the governor has to sign off. So, you know, there's still a few steps in the process, but all signs are are pointing to, um, you know, uh, some theme parks starting to reopen. And and I chatted with some folks about, you know, kind of what that means for, you know, any plans you might have this summer of going to theme parks, because obviously not everyone travels just to Orlando or or to California, you know, there are regional theme parks all across the country and everything. Um, and, you know, regional theme parks are certainly going to be looking to what's planned at Universal Studios at Legoland to kind of guide their own thinking here. So, you know, both uh, Legoland and Universal Studios, you know, they've, they're requiring uh, folks to wear masks at Universal Studios. If you don't have a mask, with you when you get there, they will give you one for free. Um, they, there's going to be uh, cashless uh, transactions, so you'll need a credit card. They're trying to avoid you know, their employees having to interact physically too much with guests. Um, you can certainly expect rides to be cleaned way more often. They might even be cleaned between every person who rides. Um, so while that will keep you safer, it also means that you know, the waits for rides might be longer. Um, one interesting thing that uh, Universal Studios said they are going to try to do is they're going to try to do virtual lines as much as possible. So they have a theme park that already actually uses this, this technology. So their um, Volcano Bay theme park, uh, water park, I should say, um, uses this technology so that you can be, you know, you can reserve a time to ride a ride, one of the, you know, bigger water slides. And then just, you know, hang out in the surf pool or you know, the lazy river or what have you um, and not have to wait online. And that technology had been rolled out before all this began. So they're planning to try and implement that in their theme parks. So basically, mm. you know, you, to reduce the amount of time people, you know, there will probably still be some sort of physical wait that you'll have to do. But it's reducing, you know, the kind of crowds that can accumulate within the queue for a ride um, as much as possible. Um, certainly going to see, uh, you know, similar to what we saw in Shanghai Disneyland when that reopened yeah. uh, earlier this month. Um, there are going to be placards everywhere that kind of say, you can stand here, but not here, um, trying to, you know, kind of enforce social distancing. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the smaller regional theme parks, you know, I was talking with experts about the industry, and they kind of have, you know, a different kind of calculus going on here. So when you're talking about, like, the Six Flags, the Cedar Fair, own theme parks, you know, the smaller regional theme parks, Hershey Park, for instance, you know, they have a different calculus because they're not open re- year round like the Orlando parks are. So the Orlando parks can kind of open when reopen whenever, and they don't have to worry about, you know, their bottom line in the same way. For a smaller park, you know, if you're, if, basically what they're saying is, you know, if you're talking about reopening in July, you know, later July, that doesn't leave you much time because those parks usually close around, you know, early fall because it starts to get too cold in, you know, the Northeast and Midwest for folks to want to go to a theme park. So they have a much shorter operating season. And there's an extent to which, you know, reopening, if it's going to be so abbreviated, you might just be sealing in a loss then. You know, there's less room for you to, you know, kind of make back whatever money you've lost from the summer months that, that haven't happened. So you might actually see some theme parks, regional theme parks, across the Northeast, the Midwest, um, choose not to reopen uh, like the Orlando and California parks likely will soon um, because, of, because of that issue. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, all I could say is when you were sit, talking about reopenings last week with Shanghai and now with Legoland, the first thing I thought was, okay, kids are going to be happy, but you know who's really going to be happy? Parents are going to be happy. All those parents who've been working double, triple duty – they're going to be so happy to, to listen to your segment, Jacob, because they're going yes. to be able to take their kids out, especially if they live in a city like Manhattan or Chicago or one of these big metropolises where they're stuck inside. The kids are climbing the walls. 
Um, I'm so happy. You're, you're making me happy. I have no kids. So I think people are going to be rejoicing. <laughs> well, well, before before people rejoice too much, keep in mind, you know, the mask part of all this, you know, uh, the Florida heat is quite, you know, as someone who grew up in Florida, uh, it's, it's hot down there. And so that, that I think is one of the big questions that remains to be seen is, you know, how much people are going to really want to do these activities, you know, if it means, you know, wearing a mask all day. You know, you might not be able to ride as many attractions as you normally would because of, you know, potentially longer waits as folks clean things. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how guest satisfaction is the first few weeks when, when you know, Universal Orlando and Legoland Florida reopen. Because if, if folks are really happy, that's probably a sign that we're adapting to the new, new normal in the, you know, kind of coronavirus world and, yeah. and rolling with the punches. But if folks are unhappy, you know, you might want to you might want to take their uh, advice uh, when you're making your own travel plans uh, and and you know stay away uh, if if you know <laughs> it gets to be too much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jacob, always a pleasure chatting with you. I mean, you are multifaceted, and you're kind of like a hydra for those who are inclined <laughs> and like Dungeons and Dragons. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Enjoy the long weekend. Get some rest. Relax. Recoup. We'll talk to you again next week. One, one, two, two, talk three, three. Take care. Bye-bye. Snoop Doggy, Hog, and Dr. Drake is at the dump. Welcome back. So back. And now we would have had any part of this, uh, the weekly pulse if we did not have the legal eagles. Today, I'm thrilled to have both eagles from their standard <laughs> undisclosed locations. David Levine, Kevin Walsh, Grim Law Group, how are you? Uh, David, uh, on behalf of, of Jeff Snyder, I, I think you probably did a great job with his introduction. You know, on behalf of the American people, a great job. Um, <laughs> I think I'm fired. Go ahead. This is great. Kevin, I'm going to stay out of this. Go ahead. This is great. As, uh, as we head into Memorial Day, I mean, I, I, I think it's a good time to take stock of what's happened in the, the first uh, third of the year, uh, despite the fact that COVID-19 has kind of slowed down action. And, and for me... Mm-hmm. The big thing this week, the big thing that happened in the first half of this year related to ERISA uh, is electronic disclosure. Do you have any thoughts on the final rule that was released on Thursday? Uh, I do. And, you know, Jeff, truthfully, we'd be lost without you because we'd just be going off on so many tangents. No, this is so great. Thanks for, thanks for giving me the holiday week in play here. Um, so, <laughs> you know, e-delivery, e- e- definitely something for us to talk about this week. Uh, you know, you know, it's shocking that we're going to pick that as our topic. You know, I'm going to try and, you know, cut to the basics, and then Kevin can go off into tea leaf land telling us what he's thinking about at this point. But um, all jokes aside, I think as a starting point, final e-delivery regulations, they have a delayed effective date. We I think it's 60 days. Kevin will correct me. But at the same time, the right now we also have the Department of Labor's sort of interim relief that – Translated to English says, look, you can use the electronic methods if paper isn't really working in this time of COVID-19. By the way, Kevin, you said the first third of the year. I'm going to say that it's almost the first half of the year, but we can we can debate the meaning of the word is if you like later. I'm, uh, but, I'm not counting days that were shut down. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, what? you sound like a legislative calendar, but that was another segment we did a while back. But 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 move. But the e-delivery stuff this week. What does it simply mean in simple English? The rise of apps, texting, uh, online, automatic, effectively communications to people, where basically the rules is, is going to be going forward. You're likely, you know, for most plans, going to have it be that employers and their plan uh, service providers send out an email saying, hey, we do everything electronically. We use your work email, the cell phone you gave to work, a personal email you gave to work, unless you opt out. The Department of Labor, in its final guidance, recognized it could be through applications that you do this or anything else, but they also say you need to give people an initial notice saying, hey, we're going to be doing this electronically. You can go here, no like 16 steps for like a privacy policy that we have to deal with on our cable bill. Mm-hmm. It is literally you go here, you can log in, and it takes you right to where you need to go if you want paper. If not, everything's electronic. Plus, you always have the right to request free copies, even if you've stayed in electronic and paper form of any document you want. But it completely flips the model. It flips from an opt-in to electronic to an opt 
out of electronic if your plan fiduciaries decide to go down that way. Kevin, I know there's and, so hey, many David, more details. David, I got, yeah, I've I'm got some hand questions off to you. for you, though. I've got, yeah. I've got some questions for you. Um, <laughs> this and, is and great. I, and, 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 and I may or may not have answers, so go ahead. We've talked about how it's opt-in. Is it opt-in for both employers uh, and employees, or is it just opt-in for employees? Do, do, do plans have to go digital if they want to keep sending paper? Plans do not have to go digital if they want to keep sending paper, but at the same time, uh, I would expect a lot of people will do that. And while you are not allowed to charge participants and beneficiaries an extra fee for getting paper, I certainly would expect that there are cost savings to be derived, both for sponsors and service providers. And I would expect if you have a plan that has massive paper usage, it, it could impact your service provider fees if they're absorbing that in their costs. So it doesn't mean you, you can force people to go one way or another, but it's certainly there are cost impacts. Does that answer and your question, Kevin? That is, David, if, if people opt out of paper, so if they're the, the Luddites of the world, you know, the David Levines who, who are worried that if they, they opt into getting emails about one thing, they'll get emails about everything. Uh, can I keep asking them to switch to digital? I, I, I think it's a, I think, and Kevin, you may have thought through this more. I'm still looking at this a bit. I think that one-time choice at that point, although I, I, have you sorted this I out? Think, because I, I, think employers, this I think employers can, yeah, I think employers can come back and ask again later. Yes, but here's the question. Uh, sometimes people, every time you log in, say, like on your credit card, switch to digital, switch to digital. Can you do that every time someone logs in? I think possibly yes, because if you're electing paper, the point is you're electing paper, and if you're choosing to use the digital tools, they have a right to ask you every time. I could see that happening. Mm -hmm. So, and then, David, one more thing, and then, and then you'll probably, this will probably set up a rant by me. Um, but if you use this electronic <laughs> delivery safe harbor, um, do I have an obligation to go and seek out to make sure that everybody's opening the emails? Do I have an obligation to track their usage? Um, do I have an obligation, you know, to, to make sure that the email is, is actually being used still by the person? Uh, I don't think so. If, if, if we've got the email and it's been valid in the beginning, I don't think so. I, I think, in fact, you might even be able to comment on something in the final rule that even addresses that. What do you think, Kevin? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's interesting how the Electronic Disclosure Safe Harbor talks about how you know, plan sponsors don't have an obligation to make sure people are opening. Uh, they don't have an obligation to track usage of these things because that could be overly burdensome and expensive. Um, but, you know, they do say if you get a bounce back uh, that then you have to treat people as though they've opted for paper delivery unless you have essentially a backup email address or um, you're able to get a different email address for the person. And kind of where where I'm taking this and the thing that I'm, I'm just jumping to conclusions here is they, they then have a sentence that says, you know, it's kind of similar for paper. And to me, that, that's kind of mind boggling because I, I feel like for the past five years, we've been saying, you know, we need guidance on what happens when a when we lose a participant who's getting paper delivery of notices. Um, and there's been a lot of enforcement about, you know, what you have to do if you have an affirmative duty to check if people's addresses are good, if you have an affirmative duty to reach out. Um, and. I think it's going to take some time to see what the implications of this language in the preamble are that it's it's that you have a similar obligation for paper as you do under this safe harbor because there's there's still a bit of a disconnect between what we've been seeing in enforcement and wait and the safe wait Ke Kevin wait Kevin are are you saying this could have a significant impact on missing participants? I'm saying that you know there's there's some language in here that it's going to be really interesting to see how it gets used and how it gets interpreted in the paper context. Uh, okay, well you know I gave you your chance to talk missing participants and Jeff, you heard me. I opened the you door did. wide open and you Kevin did. basically just took a pass. Yeah, I think it's feeling. I, are you I, feeling okay? Kevin, you gonna be all right? I I'll, I'll do my best. It's a holiday weekend. I want to stay positive and and I feel like our our <clears> listeners have heard us <throat> long enough and they don't want us. They don't want us to do an extended rant this week. I think you guys um, – look, so that's I, all I've got. I'm headed out to the uh, – you guys did a great job. I don't have to do – I don't have to host the segment anymore. I'm going to let you guys do it from now on. What do you hey, think you know, I don't know. I thought, I thought that was our worst <laughs> intro in a while. Nice. I, I, actually, 
I happen to agree. Whoever did that intro really should be relegated back to his day job. Uh, well, I thought you guys did a great job. Hey, I want to say thanks, guys. I want to wish you a very happy birthday. Some really interesting tidbits for those employers, those plan sponsors, record keepers out there. Keep it coming. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you very soon. Thanks for having us. Well, that wraps up this episode of the BRN Sunday Podcast. If you found it educational and entertaining all at the same time, we're off tomorrow. So tomorrow's Memorial Day, as you all know. So we're going to be off from programming. But we return on Tuesday with another great episode of BRN AM. You're not going to want to miss that, of course. We've got some very, have a very special guest, just to say. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. 